Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today, I want to look at the boundaries between science and science fiction and what NASA is prepared to fund. So this is something called the NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts Program. And every year, they give funding to a number of ideas that are really right out at the very edges of uh, current engineering and science, very low technological readiness uh, concepts that may one day be important, may one day enable future science or capabilities that NASA is interested in. And so they give out these awards uh, and usually it's just a paper study in many cases, although some of them include practical science. And just discussing these lets me talk about the sort of wide areas of that NASA's interested in and interesting areas of science. So I'm going to go over each of these and just we'll, we'll talk about them, right? So the first one is by Matthew McQuinn. It's Solar System Scale VLBI, that's Very Long Baseline Interferometry, to dramatically improve cosmological distance measurements. And so uh, the idea here is that they want to measure the distance to extragalactic sources using radio receivers that are distributed throughout the solar system. It orbits something like 10 AU out. Now, you have probably heard about uh, VLBI, Very Long Baseline Interferometry, where you compare the signals between multiple distant sites and by using the differences in the timing, you can measure the direction, you can get accurate angular resolution. But they want to take this one step further. What they want to do is measure the curvature of the signal as it passes through the solar system. So if you imagine a distant radio source emits a pulse of energy and it comes, it expands out as a sphere, and it's still a sphere when it passes through the solar system. So if you can measure the radius of curvature of that sphere, you can measure the distance to that source. And so this is to aid in measuring the distance to these cosmological sources. Now, they're specifically interested in something called fast radio bursts, which I think are believed to come from uh, compact pulsars, magnetars, you're generating humongous amounts of energy for a very, very short time. And they have a very well-defined uh, rise and wave front. So using this technique, it would provide another way of measuring the distance to them and therefore another way of measuring a portion of what's called the cosmological distance ladder. And the cosmological distance ladder is incredibly important to understanding the universe because this is how we understood that the universe is expanding and therefore we're able to say that things at high redshift going fat away from us quickly are probably far away. And similarly, by looking at other portions, we were able to determine that it looks like the universe's expansion is accelerating. So we got dark matter, we get dark energy out of this, and you know, maybe better measurements of this change the amounts or possibly determine that new theories can fit these observations. So this will investigate the idea of these radio telescopes out in these very far orbits so that they can measure this, uh, this uh, curvature. Okay, so the next one is Kenneth Carpenter, a lunar long-based baseline optical imaging interferometer, Artemis-enabled stellar imager. So optical interferometry is like radio interferometry, right? Where you have you know two telescopes and you get uh, you know you you're measuring the light from both of them and you combine the light and as long as you combine the light and preserve the difference in timing between the arrival of the wavefronts, you can reconstruct an image. Now, the difference between radio and optical is that in radio waves, you can actually measure the rise, the oscillation of the waves. But in light, there is currently no circuitry, no electronics that can measure the phase of uh, optical of photons as they arrive. So to do an optical interferometer, you have to take the light from these disparate optical uh, buckets, these sensors, these uh, optical um, mirrors, and bounce them through a series of optical paths until they meet at a certain point and get combined to produce this interferometer, uh, this, this image, right, which takes advantage of the large area, the large size, but uh, doesn't need you to build a telescope that is that large. And so there is this is done on earth with telescopes that are you know meters apart but nasa has been interested in flying something 
that would go in space and would perhaps have spacecraft, you know, some distance apart, maybe kilometres apart, maybe hundreds of kilometres, maybe thousands of kilometres apart. The wider apart these go, the better your angular resolution gets, but the more difficult uh, keeping these things synchronised is. So Kenneth Carpenter wants to look at doing this on the moon. Now, this is obviously using the same idea and the same technology, but it's been generally more interested, generally there's more interest in flying these in space simply because there's a penalty in putting the stuff down onto the surface of the moon. But if Artemis, the Artemis project, Artemis mission, really does begin to establish a lunar base and you start to have infrastructure on the moon, it might actually make sense to put these telescopes on the surface of the moon where they can be serviced by regular visitors and where they can also take advantage of the fact that there is no atmosphere to blur their optics. So that's what this study is all about. It's going to look at the advantages and disadvantages of placing such a telescope on the moon that could potentially measure, you know, could could image things like black hole event horizons in the optical um, optical wavelength. Okay, uh, Alvaro Romero Calvo, magnetohydrodynamic drive for hydrogen and oxygen production in Mars transfer. The idea with this, uh, oddly enough, actually, this is a, an experiment very similar to this, was actually recently flown on New Shepard. The idea is that you take water and you electrolyze it, you split it up to produce hydrogen and oxygen, and that's great because your crew needs to breathe oxygen. So this is one way to, to produce oxygen while you're, say, in space. Now, the problem, of course, if you're doing this in zero gravity, it's hard to separate those bubbles out. You'll get bubbles forming, but they don't naturally rise up. So um, systems that are supposed to do this on spacecraft have to have recirculation pumps that spin the water or spin the fluid through some system and then the centrifugal centripetal force means that the bubbles rise up and then can be recovered and separated from the liquid. So this concept says, well, we could actually get rid of moving parts if you use a magnetohydrodynamic system, which can basically move the water using magnetic fuels and electric currents. Because as you know, if you pass an electric, if a, a wire through a magnetic field, it generates electricity. And if you put electricity through a wire in a magnetic field, it makes the wire move. So this is how motors and generators work. Well, it turns out that water conducts electricity. And if you put electricity through the water in the presence of a magnetic field, it will make the water move. So you have a pump. So this is going to investigate this uh, to see whether you could build a pump or a system that could separate oxygen out of water in zero G without any moving parts. Uh, James Bickford's thin film nuclear isotope nuclear engine rocket. I love this idea. So look, and we get a diagram here. The idea is that you have a very thin layer of uh, thorium two twenty eight. And then you have a shield. The idea is thorium will decay via alpha decay. And if the alpha particles go this way, they get absorbed by the sheet. And if they go the opposite direction, they shoot out into deep space like a rocket. So you can create these very thin panels that the radiation coming off them makes them accelerate in one direction. And so if you build a system like this, say where it could close up and stop the thrust from pushing it in directions and then open it up, and generate a small thrust. Uh, according to this calculation, a 10 micron thick uh, film with a you know, half-life of 1.9 years, uh, they talk about, where is it? Delta Vs of 150 kilometers per second for a 30 kilogram payload, which is frankly insane. Uh, this is like ridiculous number. So this would be great as a concept. Obviously it's a, uh, quite radioactive. It's a different concept compared to regular engines. But uh, you know, this is this is what NIAC is about, right? The idea that, to, of investigating a an alternate solution to propulsion. 150 kilometers per second of delta V for a, a small payload like this would enable you to head out to the very edge of the solar system, rendezvous with something, and then come back 
or go elsewhere in reasonable timescales. And the great thing is because this is also a radi radiation source, it's actually generating heat and you can potentially get um, th incorporate thermoelectrics into the system and make it a radio isotope thermoelectric generator as well as a thruster. So that's what this concept is all about. Moving onwards, yes, now we have an, a Mars aircraft, a Mars aerial ground global intelligent explorer, Maggie from Gicheng Jia. So yeah, this is what we've got. We've already seen Ingenuity. Well, Ginny meet Maggie. This is a, a VTOL aircraft, which is solar powered. And once it's uh, flying, it can remain flying for much longer because it's got wings. It's not uh, a helicopter. So, and it can generate power while it's flying to help it remain airborne. This thing would move a lot faster and it could potentially scan sections of the surface for things like methane signatures or other geological geographic surveys, the radar or other concepts. So yeah, this is what Maggie is all about. So it's this is a grant to enhance this whole concept. Now the idea is it would take off like a VTOL and I think then the wings would rotate downwards and it would then fly like an aircraft and then when it came in for landing it would once again turn into VTOL mode. Uh, and that isn't even the coolest plane in this particular grant. Uh, Stephen Benner, who has been interested in working on, uh, he, he's been interested in life, uh, you know, astrobiology. So he's proposing a device, an add-on to large-scale water mining operations on Mars to screen for introduced and alien life. So the idea is that at some point in the future, if you are, say, fueling a rocket on Mars by taking water from Mars, splitting it into hydrogen and oxygen, making methane, whatever. As you're pulling that out of the ground, you might find that there is some Martian life in there. And since you're pulling tons of water out, this project, uh, the idea is to design a cell which could pull biological uh, material and at the molecular level separate it out and allow it to be analyzed. Uh, so you'd basically be taking tons of water and taking, looking at small biosignatures within this. And, you know, the guy that does this, he, he doesn't necessarily assume that all life is going to use DNA. He's got a whole set of theories on what kind of other uh, polymers could contain data, uh, information, you know, biological uh, encoding. And um, so, you know, his, his thing is supposed to work for that. That's why it's called the agnostic life finder because it doesn't necessarily detect DNA. It doesn't necessarily detect proteins. It looks for a bunch of uh, things which might fit the bill of, uh, you know, life. Okay, so Lynn Rothschild, Detoxifying Mars, the Biocatalytic Elimination of Omnipresent Perchlorates. This is at NASA Ames. Oh, hey. So... Basically, Mars, it's understood that the soil of Mars apparently contains detectable quantities of uh, perchlorates. And perchlorates are basically chlorine and oxygen. That is stuff that is just desperate to react with biological material. It will attack it. It will destroy it. It will sterilize. If you try to grow stuff in Mars soil, it would be killed by the amount of perchlorates in there. So if you were to say start living on Mars, you'd need to come up with a way of removing these from the soil. So they are proposing to actually take uh, genes that are known to break down perchlorates in certain biological organisms and develop strains of bacteria that can actually break these things down. And so this, it looks like this may actually involve uh, actual works given <laughs> on, on, you know, artificial organisms to create this but uh yeah that's that's something that's more like looking at biology and how it might be able to help uh say colonizing mars in the future thomas eubanks yes now Tom, this one is way way out there at the very very far end of the uh feasibility swarming proxima centauri coherent pico spacecraft swarms over interstellar distances so yeah this is like if we are going to fly past another star how could you 
get signals back? How could you actually collect data? So there are concepts where you can accelerate tiny probes, probes that mass grams to perhaps you know, 0.2 per, uh, you know, 20% of the speed of light. This is using a giant light bucket, kilometer sized lasers that accelerate a solar sail and then this object can shoot through space. But the problem is, how do you get data back from a spacecraft which weighs grams and can output maybe milliwatts of power and you're trying to send data back you know, set light years? Well, this concept is, well, why not send an entire swarm of them? And how do you coordinate them to send a signal back? Well, you use that, you, first of all, you send them all out at slightly different speeds so that they all arrive at Proxima Centauri or the target at around the same time and in information. Then you use that big laser to send pulses so that they can synchronize all their clocks. And then when they need to send data back, they use that synchronization information so that they can all flash, like send a light pulse at exactly the same time. And since you've got a swarm of thousands of these things, you're actually getting a, a coherent signal by having them all work together. So look, this is investigating this whole concept. Like it's, can you run software? How, what is the kind of level of power you need, how many probes you would need, just looking at all this stuff. And it is absolutely way the heck out there in the distant, you know, science fiction. They're talking about maybe this is possible in the third or fourth quarter of the 21st century. And I think that is optimistic, but would love to see it happen, right? And this is one possible uh, concept. Uh, so Beijia Zhang Lifa, lightweight fiber-based antenna for small sat compatible radiometry. The idea, uh, this is mostly looking at new ways of, of developing antenna, which are folded inside polymer fibers that can then be unfolded to form uh, an antenna. And so this is looking at like fiber fabrication with antenna inside them. So uh, I, on, I'll be honest, I don't know a huge amount about what makes that different from the other stuff, but it's in here. Ryan Sprenger, a revolutionary approach to interplanetary space travel, studying torpor in animals for space health in humans, also known as STASH. They're going to have a STASH on the space station. What this is, is an experiment where they want to put hibernating spa uh, yeah, animals in space and study them. So this is like a unit, you would have like an animal hibernating in here, they would measure metabolism, they would see how zero G adjusts things. And of course, this is looking to how you might uh, induce this state in mammals which haven't been using it in a normal, uh, you know, in the normal course of their life. Uh, because it would be really cool if you could unlock the capability to hibernate in humans so you could send them to sleep for a few months while they're in transit to Mars so that you don't need to have, you don't need to give them all that food and fuel and uh, other things to keep them busy. Jeff Landis, sample return from the surface of Venus. Oh yeah, this is straight up Kerbal Space Program uh, stuff. Now there's not much explanation here, but what I understand is, okay, obviously we've got this little... Uh, glider, they're not, this little aircraft, solar powered, it would get a sample from the surface and then return to this balloon. It would somehow transfer the sample to this and then there's a rocket inside there which would return the sample to orbit and from orbit it could be brought to Earth. Now there's one other factor here which you might not notice, it says it's a carbon monoxide rocket. So carbon monoxide rockets, I'm kind of interested in. The, for all, you know about carbon dioxide, it's very common, but you can split, you can electrolytically uh, split carbon dioxide into carbon monoxide and oxygen. And these things will burn. Now they're not the greatest rocket fuel, but they're, pr they're good enough rocket fuel that if you can synthesize enough of it, you have a lot of supply of carbon dioxide, so then it's just a case of getting the power. Now, uh, carbon monoxide rockets have been looked into for, say, Mars sample return. But in the case of Venus, if you're going to do in-situ resource utilization, 
you either have to do that on the surface and then, yeah, that sucks. But in the upper atmosphere, it's a much more benign environment. So if you can take carbon dioxide, generate rocket fuel from it, this is potentially a way of uh, doing this without sending a huge amount of mass to Venus. Now, this glider, of course, this aircraft, that is a major piece of engineering on its own because you have to have this thing somehow uh, survive the huge temperatures at the surface and uh, obviously be able to take off and fly autonomously towards this uh, balloon structure. Okay, um, autonomous tritium micropowered sensors from Peter Caboy. Caboy? Yeah. So yeah, tritium, as you know, is a radioactive isotope. It's a beta emitter. Uh, it transforms into uh, helium. So this uh, transforms into helium-3, actually. And what, by emitting beta, that's, uh, uh, that's an electron. So you can have voltaics, uh, you know, beta voltaic systems that capture these electrons and generate electrical power. So this is a concept to create small sensor packages that can survive in extreme cold environments and generate power, which uh, regular batteries won't work at some of these temperatures, and use that to explore areas of the moon with very small sensors that don't have to worry about being in sunlight. So yeah, this is just, let's make tiny sensors that are you know a few grams that we can put all over the surface of the moon and uh, collect local data. Yeah. So finally, finally, we have Aswath Patabe Raman, electroluminescently cooled zero boil off propellant depots enabling crude exploration of Mars. Now, the, the interesting part of this is the electroluminescently cooled propellant systems. So it turns out that you can have uh, you could have LED arrays which emit energy and ultimately cool the system, right? So you can use this to cool uh, a tank and keep liquid hydrogen liquid and do that in orbit. So you could have these depots near planets where you've got a lot of a uh, lot more heating than you have, say, uh, in deep space. Uh, and that would allow you to store your propellant for a significant amount of time. So the hydrogen is a fantastic propellant, especially for, say, nuclear thermal engines. But the problem with hydrogen is that it needs to be kept at about 20 Kelvin and it will evaporate with great ease. So this is really looking at using electroluminescent cooling to get rid of heat from these things and keep things cool so that you can store uh, store the, the stuff for a long period. Uh, yeah, so this is really just looking at that specific technology. I, I don't know how well this will work, but I think it's really interesting to, to look at uh, long-term storage of propellants in space, since this is what's really going to enable Artemis. And of course, Moon to Mars will want to have uh, you know any kind of propellant storage is going to be critical to all of those things. So look, that is the list of NIAC that is announced uh, so far. Now, they will actually have the second round grants, so the phase two grants announced uh, in a, you know, at some point. Those tend to be more concrete. They've got further through. They've gone through like phase one and NASA wants to investigate them further. But yeah, lots of cool stuff in here. As always, I look forward to seeing what happens with any of these. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Oh, 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 oh,